They were the archetypal rock band. Their crazy alcohol and drug fueled benders on and off stage set the bar for all those who followed. Behaviour so appalling that when the Who toured down under back in 1968, then Prime Minister John Gorton banned them from Australia forever. Now lead singer Roger Daltrey is spilling the beans on the madness, the mayhem and all that great music. Here's Angela Cox. Okay, you've got to make a cup at the back there. Oh, like that, that? Yep, okay. Right, so you go. Now you've got to purse your lips. <laughs> They're being good. <laughs> it's hard to purse them. Okay. Right, Which end you, do I say? And, and then you have to kind of squeeze your lips and wobble them, and then you kind of, you kind of use your mouth muscles mm -hmm. to make it vibrate. Okay. <laughs> Now, to bend it, you squeeze your lips. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Nearly. this was the easiest <laughs> There you go. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Exciting and unpredictable. Roger Daltrey and his band The Who were rock and roll revolutionaries. Sexy, dangerous, verging on insanity. A raw passion for the power of music. My generation. It was the first really big hit and it seems to, it doesn't matter how much time goes past, it still seems to embody that frustrated angst of youth that feel misunderstood. Is that how you well, see it? Yeah, it's a genius record, it's a genius statement. You know, people try to put us down. It's the same for every generation coming through. Um, and I remember th that the day in the studio doing that. <laughs> You know, screwing up the first line was it was a mistake at first to start it because I, I do have a stutter and I fight it all the time. Don't you all fade away? It stands the test of time and it always will because there's something about that period of our lives I'll never forget, it was, you know, it is all that frustration. You do feel that you're not understood, you're not heard. I call it my Tommy period, because I, I felt in a lot, lot, a lot of that time, especially my school years as a teenager, I felt deaf, dumb and blind. I really did. I felt that I wasn't heard, you know, I wasn't seen. Much later, Daltrey would turn that youthful frustration into the groundbreaking rock opera, Tommy. But from where Daltrey began in post-war East London, no one could have imagined the success that lay ahead. He was kicked out of high school and got a job as a sheet metal worker. If you wanted anything, you went out and earned the money to either scrimp and scrape to buy it, and if it's something you could never afford, you built it. And I love that you built your first guitar. Oh, yeah. I mean, and that, that was a thing that was quite common to a lot of rockers, like Keith Richard built his first guitar. His first guitar was probably as good as mine, which was pretty awful. <laughs> Tree recruited songwriter and guitarist Pete Townsend, bassist John Entwistle. Then came a crazy-eyed drummer, Keith the Loon Moon. It was like putting the key in the engine of a jet. All of a sudden, it kind of lifted it to a new level. And uh, it was quite obvious that he, he was bringing something to the band, that it was the glue that would make what we became. And that came from Keith, and our algorithm was formed virtually that night. On stage, The Who was a sweaty explosion of energy and ego underpinned by extraordinary musicianship.
You couldn't pick more, four more horrible geezers. I mean, make the worst noise that you've ever heard in your life. We just wanted to be free. And I, I started swinging the microphone because I was bored of standing there during a, a long solo, you know. And I, I thought, well, I'll try this. And then it got a bit bigger and it got a bit bigger. Then I just thought, this is fun. And it kept me really fit. Yeah. So it was very useful. You guys were also known, particularly in the early days, for smashing up your instruments on stage. Yeah, yes. That got a little out of hand a few times. The first time it happened, it was an accident. Um, but the reaction it got from the crowd, because Pete got angry, he broke the top of the guitar, so the guitar was kind of stuffed, and then, then decided to break the rest of it. But the audience went crazy. So suddenly, again, with these creative managers we had, they said, better do that again, not realising that these guitars were very expensive. <laughs> Hence, we were, we were in debt until at least 1972, to so the tune of hundreds of thousands. I mean, it was a joke. Oh, fucking right then! Fans never knew what The Who would do next. Play a fucking number, Townsend! But on a US tour, Keith pushed things a step too far. Keith decides that, that, that he wants a little bit more coming out of the bass drum. And with the help of a bottle of brandy and a little chat with the, uh, the pyrotechnic guy, <laughs> <laughs> managed to get the charge upgraded to something akin to a hand grenade. There's this giant explosion which blew me completely out of shot. Just blew me flat on my face. Blew Pete's hair straight up in the air and frazzled it. His hair was alight, and if you look at the film of that show, you can see Pete patting his hair because he's trying to put his hair out. It was really serious. I mean... We nearly ended up in jail for months from that show. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. But equally, it, it made every, every youngster in America wanted to come and see the hood. Unlike the other band members, Daltrey says he stayed off drugs to protect his voice. But he was a willing participant in all the mayhem, including a wild 1968 tour of Australia. We've been digging through the newspaper archives. Does this look familiar to you? You guys made quite an impression when you were out in Australia, do you remember? Yes, yes, very much so. This is... That flight uh, that you took and you all got frog marched yes. off? As we got off the plane, we all had our hands up. We all got <laughs> Which, needless to say, you guys in those days had no sense of humour whatsoever. <laughs> We've come good. You didn't. Australia's Prime Minister of the day, John Gordon, was apparently so disgusted, he fired off a telegram to the band. Dear Hoos, we never wanted you in our country in the first place. <laughs> and we never want you back. Anyway, Pete just said, right, we're never going back. And the Who didn't return for nearly 40 years. But they did play almost everywhere else and continued to create hit songs that have stood the test of time. I think Pete wrote that song after a very drunken night out with the Sex Pistols. <laughs> Which is always a great way to start a <laughs> sentence. He, like, he was so drunk, he fell, fell down in the doorway and decided to have a little sleep <laughs> and sleep it off. And was woken up by a copper. I woke up in a Soho doorway. Is is actually, that was Pete waking up in a Soho doorway. <laughs> You know, who the fuck are you? <laughs> On stage and off, The Who played hard. So much so, the magic wasn't destined to last. No one knows what it's like. Keith Moon died of a drug overdose in 1978. Everything about him was enormous. He was the most generous, the most mean, the most spiteful, the most caring, the most loving, the most hateful. Everything about him was crazy. Then in 2002, on the eve of another US tour, 57-year-old John Entwistle's life ended in quintessential rock star style. He died from a cocaine overdose in a Las Vegas hotel room with a stripper. 
We were at the beginning of a tour and we had two choices. We could stop and that would be the end of the loop. Or we could, we still had the music. Once you've got the music and you've created the music, that's always gonna be there. And the music kind of helped us through it. Also helping Daltrey through all the turbulent times, his second wife, Heather. They've been married nearly 50 years. Daltrey admits there were other women on the road, but his heart always belonged to her. Heather knew the business I was in, and I said, you know, I'll marry you, but I'm not going to be a normal husband. But you know this business, and I'm in the, one of the biggest rock bands in the world. It's worked for you, no matter well, what other people what might think of it. conventional marriage is. There's nothing better than a marriage where you're honest with each other. Daltrey is 74. He's had a few health scares, but is still performing and has no plan to fade away. He's passionate about sharing his music with an audience of 100,000 or just one. See, it's, that's when it's hard when you have to bend them. Well, so, I'll bend it. <laughs> bend it which way? Well, you squeeze your lips, squeeze your mouth. <laughs> I'm not a fast learner, am I? <laughs> we need to work on this. <laughs> And Angela is still working on those harmonica skills. Roger Daltrey's best-selling autobiography is out now. More on our website and Facebook page. Stay with Seven now and thank you for making us part of your Sunday night.